back on the table behind the tea there's some magazines with good articles there's some books you can help yourself if you'd like them um, i told you about the yeah. you want the slides yeah. just to give us your email steve one of the co-owners is giving a talk next month on drug depletion prescriptions and nutrient drug nutrient depletion from the drugs so you all have a sheet on that as a thank you from johnson's for coming um, at the end of each lecture we offer anything you want to purchase upstairs is 20 percent off it doesn't have to be just what we talk about tonight we try to make it as easy as possible everything in the store um, i also i'm going to be talking about how this is very individual and personal and there isn't one solution or one answer for your symptoms so one of the things we do is we do individual consultations, private consultations. So I do have some coupons for that. We're offering 20% off the, the consultation. That's good until June 30th. And I said, what about the cell phones? So I think we're on good shape. Can I just ask one question? You can, go ahead. When you go for the consultation, does this thing involve a blood test? I'll say yes and no. Depends on you. Well, it depends. It can always be, every, almost anything can be tested. But my philosophy is that the tests are very, very good if it's going to give us some information that's very useful. A lot of practitioners you go in and they just do a whole bunch of tests and look for numbers that aren't in the range and they say, oh, that's your problem. Let's move that number up or down. I was trained to go a different way, to listen to you. How do you feel? What's been going on? And if from what's going on, we know where we have to start, what's out of balance and how to start getting into balance, we don't do the blood test now. The blood test or the saliva or urine might be even more beneficial as we're going along. As you're getting better, but you're not 100% there, then it might give us some good information that we can use. The flip side is some people want to see things in black and white or now they're in color. And if you want to do that, we can do that too. So sometimes if there's testing right at the beginning, sometimes there never is, sometimes it's a month or two or three down the road. Because again, everyone is different. All right? Okay, so to start, how many of you I say this tactfully. How many of you think you're having a hormonal imbalance? That's why you. And I'm glad you all seem to be on this end of the imbalance because you're all smiling and happy. So glad nobody's doing this. But I'm going to talk about the adrenals and thyroid and female hormones and blood sugar and the GI tract and the liver. And I'm going to be showing how it's a hormonal sensing. There's a whole bunch of instruments there, and they all need to be in tune and working well for you to feel good. And if, let's say, the adrenals are off, you're going to see how it could look like from a traditional standpoint. Must be female hormones. I'm 50 something, my period isn't regular, and so it has to be female hormones. Or if your thyroid's off, why you could be having symptoms just like it's definitely adrenal. And it's not that it has nothing to do with it, but the adrenals aren't out of balance. They're stressed because of the thyroid. And so I'm, if I'm starting in an area that doesn't pertain to you, don't worry, we're gonna get to you, okay, as we go through. So it might be a little bit, a few different pieces at first, but if I do my job right, it's all gonna tie together during the talk. And if it doesn't, let me know, okay? Um, so as we go through this, you should be able to start either getting confused, I don't know where the imbalance is, or I never thought of that, and that really makes sense. That's why when I'm taking my thyroid hormones, they bump me up a little bit and I feel good for a couple of months, then I'm hyperthyroid, they bump it down a little, I hit that sweet spot and I feel good for a little while, and then I'm hypothyroid again. That's most likely because the adrenals are out of balance. So you 
never going to get that solid foundation. My mentor, Dr. Hins, taught us 30 years ago when I thought he was crazy at the time. With hypothyroidism, 99% of the time there's an adrenal imbalance behind it. So either that's causing the hypothyroid or with the hypothyroidism, the adrenals are off. So you're never going to get that long period of time where you feel good. You're going to keep doing this. Same thing with female hormones. And that's partly why a lot of women, you feel good and you figure, Whew, it's behind me. Then you get stressed and you get slammed up against the wall and it's back again. Okay, adrenal problems that you see every day. If the adrenals are off, you can have mood, anxiety, mood issues, depression, cravings, low energy, overweight, sleep problems, thyroid symptoms, high triglycerides, insulin resistance, um, decreased libido. Geez, that sounds like menopause. That also sounds like a thyroid problem. That also sounds like I'm getting older. <laughs> and it usually it's we're getting older and we're been out of balance longer and the body just finally can't deal with it anymore. And that's why the symptoms come up. This is a, you don't have to try to figure this out, but this is there to show you how everything is related in the body. And everything affects everything. It might not be a direct line, but if you look, the pituitary affects the adrenals. The adrenals affect the thymus, that's the immune system. If your adrenals are stressed, you get sick because it affects the thymus. The thymus affects the sexual hormones. So if the pituitary is off or the adrenals are off, it can affect the sex hormones. It can affect the thyroid. If the thyroid's off, it can affect either the sex hormones, the adrenals, the pituitary, the hypothalamus. So it's all tied together. Mainstream, we were taught, if you can draw a direct line from point A to point B, this affects this and this affects that. But if this affects this, and then this affects this, this has no effect on that. And how childish is that? Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about it, since you can't draw a direct line, that's not it. So that's why when women and men go to the doctor and there's a hormone imbalance, but it isn't a real blatant hormone imbalance, it's menopause, let's say. And then we give you some estrogen and progesterone and you still don't feel good. But with menopause, you have a little depression, maybe you should see a psychiatrist and get some therapy mm -hmm. and all that. Maybe you need therapy, who knows? <laughs> but that's not why you need therapy. It's because something else is out of balance that's driving it. So how do we get unhealthy? We get unhealthy by different stressors. There's emotional pressure, toxicity, poor diet, lack of exercise, being dehydrated. What's the road to health? The opposite. Doing some relaxation, detoxing, natural supports and interventions, nutrition, hydration, good lifestyle. If you think about it, is, or you might not think about it, because I know it was a sort of a shock for me. My parents are down in Florida, and they're in their late 80s and 90s now, but when they first went down there, they were in their 60s. And I went down to visit, and at four, I've told this before, I apologize, it's about four o'clock, everyone leaves the pool. So I figured everyone's leaving because you have the early bird special at 6.30. And what the guy who was sitting at the pool, when my parents were there, he said, no, 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 it's cocktail hour. <laughs> <laughs> and starts rocking. And I'm like, I, you know, I don't want to hear like a teenager thinking about your parents. But he, you know, they started talking about it. And it makes sense. He said, those of us that are down here, most of our family is up north, so we don't have to worry about anyone walking in on us. We're financially secure. We're retired. We're either still married, if we haven't got divorced, which means we are in a good relationship and we're in love, or if we're widowed or widower, it's not shacking up down there. Everybody has a relationship. It was sort of like the college kids, only it's okay when you're in your 70s or 80s. And he said, sex is better it's like in college days. And he said, it's not the same. It takes, and he was kidding around, he said, 
takes four hours. I was thinking Viagra, Mr. Gallus. And he said, no, you walk up the stairs like this. It takes an hour to get your shoes off. And when you both finally climb up, you know, they have the big mattresses. You have to take a nap because you're exhausted. But he said, everything works. Because we're relaxed. If you're working, you're working volunteering because you want to, not because you need that paycheck to save for college that's going to take you 30 years to pay off and all that. So stress and lifestyle has a big thing to do, a big, big effect, and we'll see how that affects all those different hormones. This is a little list of things that can affect your adrenal. So we have marital stress, nutritional deficiency, caffeine and trauma, fear, unemployment, that was a big one in the last 10 years. It still is. Lack of relaxation. How many of us know we should do something we enjoy every single day? Everybody, I think, does. How many of us do that without feeling guilty that we should be doing something else? <laughs> Three quarters of us. That defeats the whole purpose. You have 1,440 minutes in a day. If you can't, guilt-free, take 30 of them you, is it worth living? I'm not saying go jump, right? <laughs> you know, something's wrong. Out of 1,440 minutes, if you can't find 30 guilt-free minutes to do something you enjoy, why are you doing whatever you're doing so hard all day long? So relax. There's drugs and medication. Every drug we take, the liver has to detoxify. That's a stress. When we're stressed, our body puts out a lot more metabolic products and waste products. The liver has to detoxify it. The food we eat, everything that gets absorbed, the first place it goes in the bloodstream is to the liver to clean it up before it goes to the rest of the body to protect us. So even on a good day, our liver is working hard. Then the liver can only really clean up the mess we make during a day when we're getting good REM sleep. But if you have a thyroid, female <coughs> hormone, adrenal, or life imbalance, you're not sleeping well. So you're not cleaning up the mess. So the body is getting dirtier and dirtier and more backed up. That's a major stress on all those systems. Lack of sleep, smoking, overexertion, allergies, um, repeated stress, death, infections. You know, it goes on and on and on. So our poor body Getting, on a good day is getting hammered, and on a bad day it's run over with a, a truck, a Mack truck. So we have to really think about our poor adrenals and our poor liver, because they're behind a lot of our illnesses. Okay, signs of chronic stress, exhaustion, inattention, low energy, you're tired, emotionally flat, overweight. Geez, that sounds like thyroid. Gee, that sounds like menopause. Gee, that sounds like PMS. How do you know which one it is? It's probably a little bit of all of them. One of them is driving. Adrenal insufficiency, fatigue, depression, irritability, blood sugar problems, weakness, food cravings, headaches, weight gain. Gee, that sounds like menopause, adrenal, thyroid, female hormones, poor diet, doesn't it? So. This is the problem. So if you go to the gynecologist, it must be hormones. If you go to the endocrinologist, probably a thyroid. If you go to the endocrinologist about adrenals, most of them look at adrenals as two problems. You either have a tumor and it's way too high, or you're dead. <laughs> and anything in between is a psychiatrist. It's not the adrenals. But there is adrenal exhaustion. There is adrenal stress. We're starting to come into that now. Look familiar? Okay. One of the things the adrenals, the adrenals helps us deal with fight or flight and feed and breathe. Okay? And I'll go into both of those. One of the things that happens when we get stress is body mobilizes blood sugar stored in the liver as glycogen and it shoots blood sugar way up that's because we were designed for severe stress a short burst you walk out of the cave there's a lion there that wants to eat you he eats you you kill him and you escape it's over in a couple of minutes we live under stress all day long just coming here how many of you were stuck in traffic 
I'm wondering, am I going to get a parking space when I get there? Will there be room? Are they going to have the door unlocked? I might not get there till 7.01. Will they let me in? No. Yeah, don't worry. We'll always let you in. We'll find parking spaces. Don't be stressed about that. Another thing that happens is when we get stressed, cortisol shoots way up. That's for survival. When cortisol shoots up, blood sugar's up, cholesterol goes up, we mobilize adrenaline, and that's so if you get into a fight or you get damaged, you get hurt, the body can respond and hopefully you'll survive. But again, should be short bursts. When those are up high for long periods, you have too much blood sugar. So the body puts out more insulin. If the body, because blood sugar runs too high, can cause a lot of damage. And when it does that, it takes it out of the blood and puts it from here to here. You get the spare tire. So if you're chronically stressed, it's the high cortisol that's causing the spare tire to form. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is you were supposed to eat, use the blood sugar to fuel the cells in the brain, and whatever's left over goes into fat in case we can't find an animal to kill for the next week. We can live off our belly. We have stop and shop. <laughs> and so if you're stressed, when you eat, the blood sugar goes to the spare tire first, and what's left over goes to the muscles in the brain. And you start having insulin resistance. How many people, when they eat a good meal, want to take a nap afterwards? They get exhausted. That's not your diabetic or pre-diabetic. If it was a good meal, not white sugar, white flour, that's a blood sugar issue. You are insulin resistant, so are a little insulin resistant, so the blood sugar goes up, the body pumps out a ton of insulin, and it drops. That's why we shouldn't wait till 8 o'clock to eat if we have lunch at noon. Once blood sugar goes down and you eat that good meal, it can take hours for it to stabilize. And so what happens is you have this delicious, nice piece of wild salmon and sauteed vegetables and some quinoa, and you eat, your belly's out to here, that was delicious. And every time you walk through the kitchen, you grab a handful of cold cereal or a cracker or some ice cream, and you're not even hungry, but your brain's saying you're hungry. When blood sugar's down, the brain wants simple carbs and sugar, because the brain runs on sugar, on glycogen. And so if you had a snack on before you left work on your way home, a handful of nuts, some complex carbs of protein, that would stabilize blood sugar. You wouldn't be hypoglycemic when you ate dinner. You would just be going down and it would come back up and you could, maybe the cookies look good, but you might be able to walk through the kitchen without grazing all night. Think of all those extra calories mm -hmm. that you didn't need at that time. So there's usually a reason for all these things, not must be menopause, it's my female hormones. I'm constantly eating and gaining weight. Mm -hmm. Yes cookies of hormones, but it's usually something else. So with this poor guy, um, he either drinks too much beer or he's been stressed a lot, but carbohydrate metabolism gets messed up, you release stored sugar, um, cortisol, another reason cortisol goes out and goes up, it's a very good anti-inflammatory. So if you're in a fight with this big animal and you get all beat up, you want a natural anti-inflammatory <coughs> So you can keep fighting. You, know, you don't have time to go to the store, get some Motrin, and take a couple Motrin. So that's why. But again, remember, short should be up and down because it's only supposed to last two minutes. So that's fight, fight or flight. Over on this side of the camp, we have feed and breathe. When we're in fight or flight, the blood goes away from the reproductive organs and the digestive tract and goes to the big muscles in the brain. That's good. So we can think and fight or run. But what happens if we're stressed and we eat dinner? The food just sits there. Mm. We don't get all the nutrients out of it. So we become nutritionally depleted. And we're going to see why just some basic nutrients like zinc and selenium affect the adrenals, the thyroid, the female hormones. You don't need mega doses. It's like seasoning in a soup. You need a pinch. But if the digestive system isn't working right, you don't have that pinch. Also what happens is Mother Nature Made, made us to procreate. That's the reason to have sex, according to Mother Nature. We'll forget about anyone else's reason for the moment. When you're stressed, the 
blood flow goes away from the reach protection board and the libido goes down. That's probably one of the reasons we're having a big problem with erectile dysfunction and with infertility and decreased libido in both men and women because of stress. And it could be the nutritional stress, the toxic stress, the stress of work, you know, all the stressors that we looked at in the adrenals. And the reason all that goes down is nature wants us to procreate the survival of the species. So if this couple is super stressed and this couple, everything is wonderful, who's going to be the better woman health-wise to carry it and grow a baby for nine months? The de-stressed people. Who's going to be able to nurture that baby better? The couple who isn't stressed. So Mother Nature is really doing us a favor so we can make a good baby and it'll live because we're supposed to live a third of our lives, procreate for a third of our lives, stay around for a third of our lives to make sure the offspring are okay. Then we're supposed to die and leave them room. Now we've, you know, it's good that we're living a lot longer, but it's getting a lot more crowded. But we're having all these stressors, which is throwing all these areas off. And then we wonder why we're having problems. And it's not always low hormones. A lot of times the stress can cause low hormones, but it isn't the low hormones. You always want to think about the why I'm having the problem. Some clues of someone whose adrenals are out of shape. One, anyone ever seen anyone with like a butterfly mask, the lupus mask? The autoimmune diseases are blooming. They're going crazy. That's adrenal stress, acne. Not me, mine's hereditary <laughs> and started in middle school. But if you have alopecia, we're seeing that now in kids. You never saw it. Every once in a while you see someone with one little spot. Now people have, big, adults are having bigger areas and we're seeing it in kids. And why? It, look what we're doing to our kids, you know, in school. They're not, they're not allowed to be kids. They're not allowed to play. They're not allowed to be creative. It's just, you have to memorize this for the test. Everything is teaching the test. And they're not allowed to use their brains, really. It's a lot of memorizing. I shouldn't say they're not allowed. It's a lot harder. And they're not allowed to play and be kids. You're only a kid once. That looked familiar, that burnt out, <laughs> exhausted look. How about that? Turn on your blackouts. <laughs> <laughs> Road rage. Or the person with 23 items in the under 12. <laughs> or you get in line and how do you always pick the register? <laughs> Bill, can you come to register five? I need a price because <laughs> the item isn't priced and it's not in the computer. How do you pick those lines? You can't pick the right lottery ticket, but you can always pick the wrong <laughs> wherever you are. How about spare tire? How many of us know people who, if they were a woman, was in a bikini from here up and here down, she's a model figure. And from here to here, how many guys at the beach, when you look at them from the back, they could be in a Speedo, hopefully they're not, and then they turn around and they look like that guy, you know, with the belly out to here. Or how many guys now either wear their pants up here, over the belly, all the way down here? They should be a little below the belly button. Know anyone with eyes like that? The big bags under the eyes? That can be adrenals. Also, see the dark circle right at the bottom? When it's down that low, that can be a lot from the Chinese large intestine problem. The person's probably a little constipated. It can cause that, and also allergies can cause that. But funny, one of the beginning slides, if the adrenals are off, allergies are worse because the immune system's off. So it makes sense. It could be allergies, but it's probably adrenals too, and stress and toxicity. Okay, this one is very, very interesting. Now, a little bit of it hopefully will start tying together. So we have our adrenals. <coughs> the adrenals make adrenaline and norepinephrine and aldosterone. Aldosterone is for the kidneys. That's water and salt balance. That's what helps us either retain water or get rid of water. Gee, PMS and menopause water okay we need cholesterol from cholesterol we make pregnenolone so the adrenals stimulate cholesterol converting it to pregnenolone then we're at a fork in the road 
from pregnenolone, we can go over to your right and make DHEA, testosterone, and estrogen. Or we can go over to the left to make progesterone and cortisol. So the body is very good at figuring out which pathway it needs to go down every minute, and it keeps changing depending upon what the demand is. <coughs> what if we're stressed? The body is in fight or flight and it needs cortisol. So you're gonna go from the adrenals to cholesterol to pregnenolone and over to progesterone, and then it's gonna go down to cortisol. And if that's going on long enough, nothing or very little goes down the other pathway. So your estrogen, testosterone, and DHEA are out of balance, they're too low. So is that you're reaching menopause and your ovaries and uterus aren't working well and that's why you're not getting estrogen or is it because you've been stressed for so long? Okay, so that can do it. How many women who are having hot flashes or sweats or all that when they're stressed it brings on a hot flash? Yeah, because you're going down this left side. How many people, if you get over hungry, you didn't have time to eat lunch, and you're sitting in traffic at five o'clock, triggers a hot flash, or you get real irritable. Okay, and you're gonna be our poster child. Um, <laughs> I have it all. <laughs> DHEA, big mother molecule. It's a redundant system. The body can take DHEA and make female hormones, male hormones, and cortisol out of it. So it's a backup system, but if you are going down towards me, this side, your DHEA level starts going down. So then you don't have that backup system when you need it. So that can trigger problems. All right? Does that make sense? Also, when the adrenals are off, the body doesn't use thyroid, female, or male hormones efficiently. So a lot of people can go to the doctor and they'll say, your thyroid hormones are perfect. It's not thyroid but you have all the symptoms of being hypothyroid. And that's because if you're not using it well, it's the same as it being low. So when they give you a little bit of thyroid, you're forcing the system, you feel better for a short period, then you start getting a little jiggy. And then they back the dose off, you feel better when you hit your sweet spot, but then you're not using it well. It goes back and forth. Same thing could be said with the female hormone. Sometimes when someone gets hormone replacement, they feel better for a little while, and then they feel worse. And that's because it really wasn't the female hormones being the wrong level, it was the body wasn't using them appropriately. Okay, we need cortisol, and we know that. When you have low cortisol, you can have mood problems, anxiety, glucose problems, blood pressure, immune system, inflammatory. Women are more complicated than men. And I said this over and over again. I think women realize how lucky they are and how simple we are and how easy we are to manipulate. But we're simple. We, we're linear thinkers. We think one thing at a time. If there's a bunch of problems, we figure out what we think is the solution. We box it up and put it away and go to sleep and you're up worrying on it. We get up to go to the bathroom. The big worry is, did I remember to put the seat down <laughs> so she doesn't fall in because I'll never hear the end of it. Your big worry, it isn't a big worry. You get up and go to the bathroom, your brain goes on, and all the things you already decided about tomorrow, you run through it again. Yes. And so I feel bad for you, but thank God for women, otherwise the species would have died <laughs> because guys don't think that way. But when you get stressed, you turn for a moment, you turn into a man become a linear thinker. You stop forgetting things. You're thinking only the survival. You're in fight or flight. That's how we live all the time. One thing at a time. And it's good, but it has its problems. Honey, when you hear the buzzer go off, will you just pull the laundry out of the dryer? Don't fold it. Just pull it out. Sure. And you're sitting doing something, reading, and you hear it buzzing. You go, yep, I'll get that in a minute. Come on. Come on. So, we think it's funny. It is funny. Okay. So cortisol is high during stress. It's low during relaxation. We have to relax. You can deal with severe stress even for longer periods of time, but you have to relax to let the cortisol come down. Whether it's doing a crossword puzzle, watching a sitcom, 
going outside and watching the squirrels chase each other, whether some people like gardening, you know, you're getting grounded, you're pulling out weeds. It's usually fun this time of year, but come the middle of the summer when the bugs are out and the weeds are going crazy and it's aggravating. But do something like I had one, one woman that I did a consult with and I said, you need to spend a half hour every day doing something you enjoy. And the next time I met her, you know, I said, what did you decide to do? She said, I love cleaning the grout in the bathroom. The I think she needs a psychiatrist. <laughs> but that's what relaxed her. So all the grout was clean. And she went around in the kitchen, you know, all along the cabinets with a toothbrush. She just loves. Okay. When blood sugar drops, serotonin and dopamine fall. So there's the blood, one of the blood sugar connections. Serotonin, we know, is the antidepressant hormone. Dopamine. Dopamine is the good feeling one. When you have sex, dopamine shoots up. When you do something you enjoy, dopamine shoots up. When you use some illicit drugs, one of the things it does is it causes a big release of dopamine. So that's how you get hooked on it because you need that dopamine high. So you keep doing that activity to get that dopamine high. So when blood sugar goes down, dopamine drops. Nothing you do, you enjoy. You don't get that warm, fuzzy, good feeling. And with serotonin going down, you get depressed. When you get depressed, you get aggravated. When you get aggravated, you blow up at everybody. And then if you're somewhat menopausal, you trigger a hypoplastic, must be my female hormones. Um, chronic stress creates the overproduction of adrenaline and cortisol. We talked about that. So stress becomes chronic. The adrenal glands keep producing cortisol. And then we start getting, we're in daytime mode. The adrenals are supposed to be high at night and drop off. High in the morning and drop off at night. When you stress, it shoots up. A lot of people are up here all day, sitting all night. So when you get into bed, it would be like going to bed at one in the afternoon. You have a good two hour nap. The brain wakes up and says, that was refreshing, let's go. And the rest of the body says, I need six more hours. And you don't get a good night's sleep. We saw earlier what happens when you don't get a good night's sleep. You start getting toxic. The adrenals get recharged, they're a battery. They get recharged when we're in good REM sleep. So in addition to all the other problems we have as a society, sleep is a real big one. Ambien is one of the most popular drugs, Ambien and Trazodone to sleep. But when you take Ambien, it might knock you out, but you don't get REM sleep. So you're just not aggravated, but it's not the refreshing, rebuilding and recharging sleep. Okay. So how do the adrenals and remember that chart where you could go down one side or the other. How does that happen? To make a thyroid hormone molecule, this T4, has one tyrosine molecule and four iodine. Then the body, in different enzyme pathways in the tissue, breaks off one of the iodine, and that gives you T3, which for most tissue is the active hormone. So we need tyrosine to bind with iodine to make T4. Then it goes out into the body, and when the body needs the active hormone, it converts T4 to T3. Like I said before, you need selenium and the B vitamins and some zinc for that to happen. So what happens if the gut's off, and you, or you're constipated, and you're not digesting properly, or you're not eating properly? You don't have those little minerals that you need convert T4 to T3. Mainstream, because of Flint, which is the company that developed Synthroid, convinced the doctors that you only need to test TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, because that goes up and down in relationship to your level of T4. And so they just assume that the T4 is good, the body will make T3. So if you have enough T4 and TSH is good, the body's happy, it's not thyroid. But what happens is, what if you're lacking some of those nutrients and you don't have, you don't convert enough to T3? Your thyroid test is normal, but you are hypothyroid. Another thing I think is on one of the slides further down, when we're stressed, the body tries to conserve everything. 
So what it does when we're stressed is trying to conserve the energy. So it makes, anyone heard of reverse T3? There's T3 and then there's a mirror image of T3. It looks just like it, only instead of the three iodine looks in this way, it's this way. So it looks the same, but it doesn't fit the receptor. It doesn't work. So when we're stressed, the body makes a lot more reverse T3 because it doesn't want your metabolic rate to go up. It wants to conserve the energy. So that can be a problem too. If they just check your total T3, it could be three quarters inactive T3, but the number's going to copy your thyroid. But it could be the wrong form of T3. Okay, this is another way to look at it. So if cortisol is elevated, we saw how if it goes down the left side, you don't make DHEA. What that does is we have an increase in cortisol. It's, oh, let me back up. So the tyrosine and iodine make T4. We need tyrosine to make cortisol. The body looks at what does it need to do for survival, what's more important. If you are stressed, you can live with low thyroid. You need that fight or flight response to get away from the lion. So the tyrosine goes to the cortisol pathway down that left side, away from the female and male hormones to make cortisol so you can run away from that lion and then you can have sex later on. You're not worrying about that now. So you, it uses the, all the, a lot of the available tyrosine. You get depression, dry skin and nails, cold hands and feet, decreased energy, slow starting in the morning, weight gain, ATP is our energy. Geez, that's low thyroid, that's menopause, that's all the issues we're talking about. Also, when cortisol is elevated, causes an increase in cholesterol. It causes um, nighttime eating syndrome, decreased serotonin, short memory, sleep problems, increase in um, aromatase, increase in estrogen, the estrogen progesterone ratio goes off, increased insulin resistance, increased belly fat, increased water retention. Is that menopause, thyroid, or adrenal? Yes. <laughs> It's probably a little bit of all of them. But in this instance, it's because of the stress. The adrenal is the why. It could be the thyroid or the female hormone. So you have to figure out what is not allowing your body to adapt. And the why is what you need to work on. You might need to take something to feel better now so you have the energy and the capacity to work on the why. But you always have to... Why did my body adapt to that? So the problem is over here, even though the symptoms are there. It started here, and the body finally got overwhelmed where it couldn't deal with it anymore. Then you have the symptoms. So when you first start having hot flashes, it's not, oh, yesterday I must have gone into menopause, a perimenopause. <laughs> it could have been years your hormones were off, but the body was in good shape and it was able to deal with it. Let's talk menopause. I guess we are talking menopause but there's usually two camps of women, basic camps. There's the women who, menopause wasn't bad, I was a little irritable, a little sleep problem, I got a little warm, maybe a little vaginal dryness. Then there's the other women, I always have a suitcase in the trunk with six changes of clothes. <laughs> I haven't slept in two years. Um, my husband, you know, is wearing his hockey equipment because he never knows when I'm gonna throw something at him. And realistically, I won't tell him, he never does anything. It's just, he'll look the wrong way, and I'm off the edge of the cliff. Those women who are really having a hard time with menopause or going through it, usually have been stressed for a long time. So the adrenals have just finally had it, and they can't, they don't have the capacity to deal with the hormone flux. So you are having hormone fluxes, but it's the adrenal can't deal with it. And you know, I see nodding, you probably know women in both camps. And so really think about it. So if life has been really stressful and you're having a hard time with menopause, female hormones you can use pharmaceutically to suppress symptoms. But if you never deal with the adrenals, as life goes on, you're never going to feel right because you never fix the why. Can the stress encourage um, 
menopause, or is it more complicated? <laughs> Can the stress encourage or accelerate you going into menopause? Yes, because it should. If nature or God is a woman, it should, it must be if she did all this work, but it should be a transition. We were meant to have very little hormones. Women are supposed to have a whole bunch of hormones, and then we're supposed to have them drop off. So you're not fertile anymore, but you should still be in a good mood and enjoy sex. What's happened is we're so stressed that when the hormones start changing, the body is so brittle and the adrenals just can't adjust that everything starts, I don't, I don't want to say shutting down, but not working properly. So if you are really stressed, that can bring you into people who have had tragedy in their life or an awful lot of stress, a lot of women, all of a sudden go into menopause. Mm -hmm. You know, my sisters, my mother, they were all in their 50s, 35 years old. I went into early menopause. I didn't, but you know what I mean. Um, so that can be it. Same thing, if you get really stressed and you're younger, you can miss your period. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? Mm -hmm. The hormones are still cycling, but it's the adrenals and the thyroid, the, the symphonies are off. We have a lot of women who are menopausal age, which is, you know, a big variety. Their adrenals and the pituitary and everything's a mess. And when they start getting things back on track, and some of them are happy and some of them want to kill me, mm. but they start cycling again. And, you know, if they haven't been out of cycle for too long, I tell them, you better be careful because you could be ovulating too. You could. You know, and that would be a stress if you're <laughs> 49, 52, the kids are out of the house and you have a baby. You know, yeah. Talk about adrenal fight or flight stress all the way around. Okay, DHEA and cortisol we talked about. Now, DHEA <clears throat> helps build up the body. Cortisol, <clears throat> on one hand, breaks it down. It's helping to protect the body. So there's a balance of DHEA to cortisol. So if your DHEA is too low, it can't protect you from high cortisol. If cortisol is too high, you're not making enough DHEA. You're going down this side of the path. So that can cause a lot of problems. Now, if DHEA cortisol imbalance, mucosal integrity. What happens in menopause? <coughs> Vaginal tissue gets, one is due to estrogen going down, but it gets very, they call it, a lot of the doctors call it friable. It's very, very sensitive. It gets irritated very easily. Better chance of getting vaginal or urinary infections and all that. How did that do to the DHEA cortisol imbalance? Not so much just the low estrogen. Um, protein problems, weight gain, collagen problems. When you start getting stress, the people who are really stressed get the real deep stress lines. That's because you're destroying your collagen. And you're also frowning and scowling and all that. But there are women who, women and men, I'm sure you all have seen this when you went to high school reunions or even now, there are people you see and you can't believe they're 80 years old. Mm -hmm. And then there's people you see and you can't believe they're 50. <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with stress, not just hormones being up or down. People who exercise, you go to the gym, not the big gym rats, but there's a lot of, I'll say, us more mature people at the gym that look pretty healthy. And then you see some of the 20 and 30 year olds and you figure, you know, it's a good thing they have the defibrillator in the box over there. They look terrible. That's stress and how you took care of yourself. You can always turn it around. DHEA cortisol problems, ovarian function, thyroid function, there's infertility. There's your cycle changing. Now, it does change when you go into menopause, when hormones change. What if it starts happening earlier? That could be due to the DHA cortisol imbalance. Why? Maybe because you've been very stressed or you haven't been eating well or, you know, I have to work two jobs or I'm worried about everybody or I'm doing for everyone and I'm not taking care of myself. So, the why? What can you do? We can supplement with DHEA if you're low. More isn't better. Again, seasoning in the, in the pot. 
You need some. That's very easy to test. It'll be tested saliva or blood. Your DHEA level's low. You need to fix the Y, but you can supplement to bring it up. Guys have to be careful. If you look at the pathway, DHEA goes down to testosterone. In women, most men, if they take DHEA, it goes to estrogen. So if they start taking too much, they start getting large breasts. And you know, then what's going on there? But it's just you're making more estrogen. We don't convert it then to testosterone too well. You need to really figure out ways to relax, and do something you enjoy, whatever it is. Now, that lady with the grout, I think she's nuts, but like you said, I'd love to be her best friend. I, one year, I, we had, remember about three years ago, we had all those real bad winter, we had bad ice dams. So wound up tearing all the cedar shakes off the back of the house, dry out the house, had new insulation put in. And I spent my free time in the summer double staining both sides and reshingling with nice new cedar the outside of the house. My neighbors thought I was out of my mind. They said, that's why you work to hire someone to do that. I found that when I had the time, so relaxing, because I like doing that stuff. So that could have been a real stress for you and you would have been ready to jump. For me, it was relaxing. The grout, more power to it. <laughs> but, so you have to find what you like. Doing crossword puzzles. I can't stand crossword. I like fixing things. The word crossword puzzles, I just, my blood pressure goes up. My wife loves it. So I did cedar siding and she did crossword puzzles. Okay. Cholesterol, very, very important. We saw on the chart how cholesterol then is needed to make all the hormones. What's happening with everyone on Lipitor and Crestor, and we're pushing cholesterol down. Geez, your cholesterol is 150, good for you. Terrible. Where the new protocol, if my parents' cholesterol is high for any reason, all their siblings, uh, all their descendants, all their kids should be on Lipitor as a preventative. So we're putting these girls that don't have high cholesterol on a statin and is pushing their cholesterol down. What's that doing to the female hormones? Then we have infertility, so we inject them with huge doses of hormones to try to get them fertile. What happens? Cholesterol, you saw what it was needed for. It's also used to help treat inflammation. What's happening to us if cholesterol is too low? We have a little arthritis. We have a lot of arthritis. And the more inflammation there is, the faster things break down. But that's good for hip and knee replacement surgery, which helps the economy. <laughs> and you know, it's just, it's crazy. So we need cholesterol. Fat's got a real bad, I'll go on my soapbox for a minute. Because of man-made fats and what we did to it, all fats got a bad rep. Eggs got a bad rep. Now all of a sudden, was it 30 years later, they're saying, gee, if you have six eggs a week, even if you have high cholesterol, it's not going to affect your cholesterol level. It's all coming from the liver. So we eliminated eggs, we eliminated nuts, we eliminated good fats. For what? Because a test said, geez, fats are no good. Okay, we're back to this, just to remind you, the estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, all are directly related to adrenals and cholesterol and stress. So if your estrogen and progesterone are off, is it off because your ovaries and your uterus are starting to get tired and it should be coming down? But if that's the case, it should be a nice, easy landing going down. If it isn't, something is causing them to be more out of balance and not used properly. Make sense? Okay. How many of us feel like that? <laughs> Adrenal problems, or blood sugar problems, your blood sugar is going up like this, up and down. You eat, you get tired, talk to me, you need to do something about insulin resistance. Very easy to fix. The younger generations now, the little kids that are obese, they're saying 80 to 90 percent of them will be diabetic and they, by the time they hit 20. That's self-inflicted and preventable but we don't do it. It's the simple carbs, the white sugar, the white flour, and our poor lifestyle. And that can, for most people, unless it's genetic, 
that can be corrected and prevented. If you eat a good healthy meal and most of the time you need to take a nap, that's your blood sugar doing this. We can deal with that. Don't wait. Your doctor will probably tell you, yeah, your A1C is up a little. And don't worry, we'll keep an eye on it. When the blood sugar gets off far enough, we'll give you medicine. Why not do some work and prevent having to have the medicine? Another way to look at it, where I like the female hormonal symphony. It sounds true. <laughs> but we're like a car. Every single component in your car is important, unless you have all these fancy bell and missiles. So you have six spark plugs, and one of them isn't firing properly. The car doesn't run well. So we need all the little pieces all working together. Same thing in our body. Not just the hormones, not just the liver, but our lifestyle, the fuel we're putting in, the waste product we're pooping out. Um, we won't, that's a whole other lecture, but talk about bowel movements. Babies eating poop. They usually poop while they're eating. You know, we shouldn't do that. That would be disgusting. <laughs> we have a little more control about of ourselves. But a good portion, I would say the average American now goes to the bathroom every two to three days, has a bowel movement. What happens to the nine meals? It's all sitting here. And if it's all in the tube, how do we absorb the nutrients? So we're more nutrient deficient, which makes the bowel work less. It doesn't work as well. And if you're nutrient deficient, you don't have the zinc and the selenium and the magnesium to help convert T4 to T3. Anyone here, Charlie horses, restless leg, or sleep with someone who has restless leg and yeah. keeps you up all night while they sleep? It's usually the guy. Yeah. We used to always say, that's potassium. We <coughs> solve the potassium problem. It's usually magnesium. Add some magnesium. Very interesting thing. When you stress, you use more magnesium. When you stress, you usually have more restless leg. You don't get a good night's sleep, you have more restless life. Or chali horses. Mm -hmm. We need magnesium or you get constipated. Magnesium, that big bottle of calm powder, mm -hmm. is magnesium. Great marketing. And you have to heat up water, dissolve it, and sip it. It makes you slow down, forced relaxation. How many people, now granted bathtubs have changed from the big, the coming back to soaker tubs. And most of us, our bathtub is so small you can't get in it and lie down. But how many people have taken a nice relaxing bath? Okay, good. Good for you guys, ladies. But most of us, we don't have time. And what's more relaxing than putting some essential oils in a little bath salt or, or um, Epsom salts or sea salts? Maybe. I think women do this more, guys do it when they're trying to be, get lucky. But a couple of candles and a good book, and just turn the lights down and just get into the tub and soak for 40 minutes. We don't have time. That's your relaxation. It also helps you detox. But we don't do it. So now we're making bathtubs much smaller. So it's great for kids, but once you get to be about three and a half feet tall, you can't lie down in the bathtub anymore. And now the new tub, they're making them so big, you look at it and you go, but like then do I want to clean it? <laughs> we need the lady with the grout. <laughs> okay, another very interesting thing. Thyroid, one of the things it does is regulate our temperature, right? You're hypothyroid, you're cold, you're hyperthyroid, you're hot, and all that. Our digestive enzymes from the pancreas have to be at 98.6 degrees, give or take a drop, to work efficiently. So if your thyroid's off, your pancreas is pumping out all these enzymes you need to break the food down to absorb the nutrients for the machine to run, but they're not working well because the body temperature's off. Also, that the adrenals and the thyroid are directly related to the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So if either of those are off, your enzymes don't work as well, and you don't make enough acid, you can't digest your food, you get more toxic, you get more malnourished, you have more hot flashes, you have less energy, you start craving the simple carbs, your blood sugar is doing this, and then you go home and want to tear somebody's head off. So we're back to renal and thyroid. The hypothalamus helps 
causes the release of thyroid stimulating hormone, ACTH stimulates the adrenals, FSH and LH, a follicular stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, you need those to pop an egg and get pregnant. So if the adrenals are stressed, that stress of the hypothalamus, that doesn't happen. Also stress decreases thyroid stimulating hormone. So then you have lower thyroid levels, that's survival. Remember, short term is supposed to be stress. But if we're really stressed and you won't have your thyroid check, your thyroid might be low. But it could be because you're so stressed, not because the thyroid can't do your job. Could be that you've used up all your tyrosine. Could be you're out of iodine. Back in the 40s or 50s, there was the goiter belt in the middle of the country because we, we depleted iodine. The soil is depleted. So what do we do? They passed a law that we have to iodize salt because we were eating pounds of salt. And that solved most of the hypothyroid problem. It's like a, a mason. You wanted to build a 10-foot wall and you only gave him enough bricks for a 5-foot wall and you yell at him all day. Give him the bricks, he'll make the wall. Give the thyroid, if it's healthy, tyrosine, the iodine and all the little things it needs, it can make more hormone. But what if the adrenals are off? You're not gonna make the hormone. So it's all related. Where to start? If you have an adrenal and a thyroid problem, chicken or the egg, where do you start? So that's where trying to dig back, if it's more of an adrenal issue that's driving it, you work on the adrenals and a lot of times the thyroid falls right into place. If energy level is great and you can push yourself physically and not crash, then the adrenals might be off, but they're okay. <clears throat> then you stop with the thyroid. What if it's the female hormones that are stressing the adrenals? So you have adrenal symptoms, but it's really the female hormones are way off. Then you would start with the female hormones. So I'm just getting all these looks like, okay, so how do we figure that out? <laughs> Part of it is symptoms. There's something that I've used for years. It's called the Symptomology Solution Questionnaire. It's 600 and some odd questions, which is enough to get you super stressed. But it's very easy. It's all just check off. Did you have this symptom in the past? Do you have it now? Mild to severe, how it affects you? All those answers go into an Excel program and different combinations of the answers and whether it was past or present, mild or severe, the, the report that comes out gives us all the different systems in the body and which ones aren't working appropriately, whether they're too high or too low. And it gives us a ranking which really helps narrow down what's probably driving you the problem now so it helps. Another interesting thing in that you could have come out high adrenal stress and adrenal exhaustion. How can the adrenal be too high and too low? Same thing with female hormones, same thing with th thyroid. You could have some symptoms of hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. How can that be? It has to be too much hormone or not enough. What we found was the pituitary it's like a computer chip. A Pentium, well, I guess now we have to do, I don't know what the process is, our isolated Pentium. It takes all the information from the hormone systems and figures out what do we need to do to get the most work done using the least hormones to conserve. When one or two of the systems are off, the pituitary disengages because it's like a computer. We've got garbage information in, it sends out information that makes things worse. So you can function with each of your hormone systems not coordinating, and you can look to be a ripe old age, but it's very inefficient. So when you have all the hormone systems come up that there's major imbalances there, and they're both high and low, we do pituitary work. And nourish the pituitary, it gets it working, and the symphony starts again. The pituitary is like the conductor of the symphony. Adrenals in the GI. When you're in fight or flight, the blood goes away from the GI tract. You have digestive order problems. Well, if you have digestive problems, you have adrenal problems because it's stressful on the body. Toxicity. The heavy metals and a lot of the man-made chemicals 
corrupt the enzyme pathways. We need those enzyme pathways to convert T4 to T3. We need those pathways and all the trace minerals and all that for all of our enzymes to work. If anyone has trouble falling asleep, I highly recommend you get a metabolic pathway chart. These are all the metabolic pathways in the body. And if you start reading this, you'll see, oh, that one needs B6, that one needs magnesium, that one needs manganese. Digestion's off. Your metabolic pathway doesn't work. Do you sell that here? No. I got this years ago, but if you want to look at it, we can pass it around. And if you go online, I've seen these online for sale. I think, I know when I bought it, I think it was laminated, it was $10. But it's very, very hard to read, but very interesting. It shows how complicated we really are. So, liver and adrenals. The liver, like I said, detoxifies. It cleans everything. So if you're stressed and you're not sleeping, your liver is overloaded. When the liver starts storing a lot of the man-made chemicals, if that's soluble, down the road, we start getting fatty liver. Never heard of fatty liver up until about 10 years ago. Now, you say, oh, for someone your age, don't worry about it, we'll keep an eye on it. You shouldn't have a fatty liver. That's, the body's getting toxic. When the liver gets overloaded, the body starts burying the toxins and the waste product in the connective tissue. In the spots where people are diagnosed with fibro, for fibromyalgia, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And they're not sleeping well, and they're not eating well, and they're not enjoying life, and they're very stressed. And if they have a couple of good nights sleep, the liver does some phase one, phase two, the pain goes away, and their energy goes up, and they feel better. But since they've been sick for two weeks, they go out and do two weeks worth of stuff in 24 hours. They generate all this metabolic waste. They don't get a good night's sleep and they crash again. So what do we do? We give them drugs for all the symptoms, which overload the liver even further. People with fatty liver, you do liver support, and all of a sudden you've had a miraculous recovery. You know, you don't have fatty liver down. What's the, so, what's the test for that? Fatty liver is usually a biopsy. Oh, and what about adrenal and other... Like, there's, the there's a saliva test for that. It's a four-part saliva test, morning, noon, supper, and bedtime, so it charts out the full circadian rhythm. Okay, so we talked about the questionnaire. Okay. With overuse, low blood pressure, hypoglycemia, a mental, you're tired, weight loss, muscle weakness, stress, thyroid function, nutrition, toxicity, the gut and female hormones can all cause stress on the adrenals. So again, everything is related and everything is tied in together. And you really can't just say, this is my issue because everything affects everything. If it's an adrenal issue and the gut is off, as you fix the adrenals, you should probably do a little support for the gut to help it get back on track. But a lot of people will say, well, I tried a probiotic and an enzyme, it didn't work. I tried a little adrenal support, it didn't work. I had my female hormones checked, and they gave me a low dose, it didn't help. What if it's the seasoning in the soup? You needed a little support in those three areas, not major amounts, but a little bit, you might have fallen. So we have to sort of get away from the mainstream model that we have to find the one thing that's wrong. Because there's never one thing wrong. You know, if you bang your finger, it's one thing that hurts. But something else, everything affects everything. So you have to do support in a bunch of different areas. Okay, people when they're stressed, what food do you crave? Salt. salt. Take, okay, salt. Animals, smarter than we are. Birds and cows, they have salt licks out in the field for them. When they get stressed from the heat or because a rattlesnake was bothering them, they go over and start licking the salt lick. Because the adrenals use sorry, the adrenals use sodium when they're for their function. So when you're stressed, you have a much higher demand. Our problem is we've screwed up our brain. We don't think of salt as the raw salt or the kosher salt or the Celtic salt or the sea salt. We think of salt as popcorn, potato chips, French fries. If you think about it, 
if you were really stressed and went in to D'Angelo's, would you think, okay, I'm stressed, let me get a nice sub on a multi-grain roll with some oven roasted turkey and all that. You see the bags of potato chips and stuff salivating because that looks good. We're trained, that salt, this potato chips and french fries. Then you put in all that fried food, the white potatoes, or the white flour, and things like that to make your blood sugar do this. So you're giving the body the salt and stressing the adrenals further. So we really have to think about it. You want to cut down caffeine, nicotine, alcohol. You want to get more sleep, prescription drugs. If you need them, they're lifesavers, but they're not the answer. We overuse them and we use them wrong. So if you need to use them, I'm 100% for it. We thank God we have them. But if you keep, remember the Zantac commercial when it first came out, it was the guys and they were gonna go to a bar for it was a game on beer and pizza. And one guy says, no, and after I eat that, I'm up all night. And his buddy goes, I just take a Zantac. Mm -hmm. Any way to use the drug. <laughs> okay. Question. Nutrients, yes. Um, what do you recommend for salt? Like I know there's like that. Okay, going back to the salt and the iodine. If you need iodine, you can there's iodine. And there's drops. You can add it to water. It doesn't have to be iodized salt. And the problem with the more <coughs> iodized salt, they add other things, anti-caking agents and all that. So if you can get the sea salt or the Celtic salt, a lot of it does have some iodine in it. You can eat kelp with the iodine and things like that. There's nothing wrong with salt. You just don't want to have too much of it. Mm -hmm. We need salt. And when a lot of people go in the hospital and they're having a heart problem, they put them on a uh, no-salt diet and they start passing out and they start failing. We need salt. And if you're under stress, you need even more salt. Not large amounts, but you need enough. Not eliminate. And so we have to think about that. Can we, can we have like seed plants also? Yeah, yeah. seed plants that like help and all those are very, have, a, have iodine. Now, also on mainstream, we talk about iodine in micrograms. Realistically, six and a quarter to 12 and a half milligrams of iodine for a lot of us isn't enough. We might even need more than that. So taking a lower dose, six and a quarter, 12 and a half milligrams of iodine a day, we will worry about causing hyperthyroidism. It doesn't happen, we, our iodine level is so low. We have so many people with subclinical hyperthyroidism and the majority of them is they're low on tyrosine and iodine and you add that in and they do much better. Does we had a lot of people who have their thyroid hormones decrease once they got the nutrients. Does yes. the thyroid, um, I'm sorry, does the uh, Himalayan salt have any iodine in it? No. The Himalayan, I don't believe there's any Himalayan that does. Okay. I know the sea salt and some of the kosher salts do have it. Okay. It all so depends upon where it is. The North Sea expected. salt has iodine in it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, um, we need zinc, we need omega-3, sulfur, iron, mag magnesium, vitamin E, C, the B complex, all help. But not, this slide was about adrenal, but you need those to convert thyroid hormone. You need them for the liver to do phase one, phase two, detox. You need it to help convert a lot of the amino acids into neurotransmitters for the brain. You know, all these little things are used everywhere in the body. Yes. Do you mean as a supplement or do you mean in the food? Both. Mm. Now, ideally in the food, but realistically, we the food isn't what the food should be. Now, coming into the nice weather, we're going to be getting all the local grown, organic vegetables and the fruit, and you're going to get more C and B complex, excuse me, than your body could possibly use. But then when we go into the fall, into the winter, everything is picked, unripened, and shipped. And even if it's fresh, it's weeks old, and things start breaking down. How many of us eat strawberries in the middle of the winter? Do they taste anywhere near as good? 
That's because they're not. They're white in the middle. Mm -hmm. But they, they're, if they're not the organic ones, they're engineered, so at least they're red on the outside and nice and big, so they look good. We should be eating what's in season. Um, we can live without strawberries for five, we don't want to, but for five months. You know, the, some things like the wild Maine blueberries, a lot of the stores get them flash frozen, and they did some studies and they found they flash freeze them right, and so they have about 95, 90 to 95 percent of the nutritional value that they had when they were fresh. The strawberries aren't that way. And so, you know, we have to really look at what we're eating. It could be the right food, like greens, eat iceberg lettuce, you're getting a little fiber and water. I mean, personally, no nutrition there. So you can't just say, yeah, but it's a leafy vegetable. I mean, leafy vegetable, not quite the same as kale or spinach. Yes? How do you know if you need iodine? Well, one, there are tests that you can do for iodine. They do it a couple ways. One is just to check the background level. Another way is an iodine challenge. They give you a certain amount of iodine and collect the urine for 24 hours and see how much comes out. And if the majority of it comes out, the body is losing it, you're flushing it out. If very little comes out, the body needs it. When if you get one of the iodine books, they go into a lot about iodine. Another way is if you're not using mega doses, if you take the iodine and you blow, the body's starving for it. You're not going to feel better. You just, within a month, you'll notice either energy or temperature regulation is doing better. And so you can do a trial that way. You know, six and a quarter milligrams or 20 to 12 and a half isn't going to hurt anybody. And so, you know, it's a very easy way to do it. Same thing with the tyrosine. Adding some tyrosine in. We're using that now in chewable form. There is a lab for kids with. ADD, ADHD, that are really revved up, you give them tyrosine and they calm down because it gets the adrenals and thyroid more in balance, so there's less stress in the body. And so that's a simple thing. And tyrosine, you know, in normal amounts isn't going to hurt you. You know, with any nutrient, if you take way too much, you can hurt yourself. One of our friends got a juicer, she's a real health nut, and she liked kale, she used to stir fry, uh, saute a little kale with onions and all that. But when she got, you know, what was the big juice, the Vitamix, you know, you can <laughs> chop up bricks in that. She was juicing about a pound and a half of kale every day. No, you know, that makes four ounces. And then she'd add carrots and everything else. And she's probably about this tall. She wound up in the hospital for six weeks. Oh, but she got so constipated and irritated her bowel to a point they put her on IV nutrition for a week just so the bowel could calm down. And kale is excellent for you, but water is excellent for you, and if you drink too much, you die. Did she do it raw? Did, what she, did, she, did she do that raw? Did she do it raw? Yeah, she just threw it in the Vitamix and ground it up. No, you can eat kale. 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 She had a drink, just too much. But in that amount, <laughs> spinach is good for you. A lot of people, because of some of the minerals in it, if you eat too much spinach, it's very, very binding. How do you know how much is too much? But you get punched. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Miralax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sulfur you can get from a lot of the cruciferous vegetables. And that's why it gets so good for us. And that's why a lot of people, if they start eating cruciferous vegetables in large amounts, they have a problem because they're hard to digest. And then you get the liver working real good. And if you push the liver too much, that's not good either. So you should eat some and slowly increase it. And so cruciferous vegetables are excellent for the liver. Very good for phase one, phase two broccoli, cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts, um, what's the white one? Cabbage? Cauliflower. All of a sudden, nobody would eat it. It's white, it has no taste, you know, broccoli at least is pretty. Now cauliflower is the biggest, the biggest thing. You roast it, it's sweet, yeah, it's delicious. You, they're now grinding it up and making um, 
mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes out of it. Oh, oh, oh. You know, and, and there it was all the time. The big head's what a buck and a quarter. Oh, it's going oh, way up. Yeah, well, because it's popular. We shot ourselves in the foot. Okay. Which um, one? Um, I say licorice. Yep. And I love licorice. What's that all about? This licorice is very good for tired adrenals. It helps bring the energy level up. The problem with licorice in an extract is it also can be a little <coughs> liver stimulating so it can raise your blood pressure if you have too much. This product has licorice and andrographis. Andrographis is a wonderful adaptogenic herb. If you're too stressed, it calms you down. If you're a little exhausted, it can wake the mind up, not stimulate it, but clear the fog. So the combination of them is very, very helpful. We use it a lot for tired adrenals. There's adrenal complex. This has some of the glandulars in it, the adrenal, the pituitary, the thymus. One of the problems when your adrenals are exhausted, you are using 100% of what they're putting out, but you need more than that. You're not making enough. So each day, you're going along and you crash. So when you sleep, you make some of the hormones, but you drain the tank completely. You want to fill the tank up and fill up your reserve tank. That's how we survive when we have babies and we don't sleep for two years. We're living on the adrenal reserve. And then when we finally get some sleep, we fill up the tank. So what that does is it takes the pressure off so you're not using 100%. It substitutes for them a little bit. So you can then every day maybe only use 80% of what you made and you can build them back up. Anyone who has adrenal exhaustion, I tell them every day only do 80% of what you think you're able to do. Because what will happen is you'll get some more energy. You go to the gym and you go, great, I can run. I can go lift weights. You burn up everything. You go home and crash. And so you made three steps forward and you took three and a half steps backwards. You want to be filling up the tank. If your adrenals are a little too high, something like the HPA Calm. It has phosphatidylserine, um, taurine, theanine, glycine, glutamine. This is very good if the adrenals are stressed and the thyroid's off of it. It's not stimulating, it's not suppressing, it just helps with the balance. So there's all, depending on what's going on. Anyone ever hear of phosphatidylserine or the phosphatidyl complex? They're very good when cortisol's high. When cortisol's high, you have so much cortisol, and the same thing with L-theanine, that the cortisol receptor becomes less sensitive to cortisol because there's so much of it there. So the body's trying to protect you. So what does the body do? It pumps out even more. Mm -hmm. So what phosphatidylserine and L-theanine do is, I'm oversimplifying, it clears out the receptor and brushes it out so it's now more sensitive then the cortisol goes in, locks in, gets a good stimulation, and the biofeedback says to the adrenals, okay, calm down, we're good now, as opposed to nothing's happening, make more. So there's so many different things. You don't need a value for that. And you'll find that's very common. L-theanine, very, very good for stress in the beginning of anxiety, you know, for stress all the way up to mild anxiety. Gabacom is... It's not GABA, but it has the precursors for GABA. That's the ultimate emergency break. That's very good for anxiety. Some doctors have used it for breaking panic attacks. We also use that for people with sleep cycle problems. They have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. We have them take two, three hours before bed and two at bedtime. And a lot of times it starts normalizing the REM sleep cycle. And the body knows where it wants to be. It just lost its way. So you just remind it and gets back on track. Um, adrenal stress. We talked about L-theanine, the phosphatidyl, fish oil, potassium, magnesium. We're all, the soil's low on magnesium. We're putting calcium in everything. Orange juice has calcium. Oranges don't have calcium in it. But you can get a full daily dose of calcium in four ounces of OJ. There's a calcium-magnesium balance. Calcium causes constipation, can lead to constipation, magnesium loosens things up. Calcium in the muscles is a calcium-magnesium pump. When we contract, calcium goes in. Magnesium has to go in to relax the muscles. 
that's why we have restless leg and leg jolly horses more often now. Magnesium is used in the brain for calming. So there's a balance in our system. And if we worry about osteoporosis and bones and calcium, let's load up on calcium. It's calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, silica, boron. You don't need mega doses. You need in seasoning in the soup. You need some of all of it. And weight bearing exercise, good night's sleep, and low stress. Is anyone use homeopathy? Drops of pellets. Wonderful product, Adrena Code. And Adrena Code is made up of about 14 different remedies. But if you look at the Materia Medica, each of these describes the adrenal when the adrenals are off. That's what individually is used for. So the blend very tonic to the adrenals. So how do you know which one and what's right for you? That's what we're here for. So to help guide you, we want to give you information. And we're not trying to sell things. We're trying to educate and let you, because I can give you information, but you have to do the work. You have to give me the information. And that's the hardest part, trying to think, how do I feel? Nobody asks us how do we feel. When you go to the doctor, what's your symptom? Here's a drug for the symptom. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when you get the drug, the next time you see the doctor, if it's thyroid prescription, they maybe will take blood. And if the blood looks good, that's great. But how do you feel? Do you feel better or worse? That's more important than the blood level. Because the blood level, you ever notice some of the ranges? Like vitamin D normal is 25 to 100. Minus three. You're lucky you're. A lot. That's what they said. <laughs> but what if on thyroid hormones there's a range? What if I need the ranges where 70% of the people who had a test would fall? What if my normal is at the top of the range and your normal is at the bottom of the range? So if you are tested and you have my range up at the top, you're going to feel terrible. And if I have yours, I'm not going to be able to get out of my own way. But we look at what the computer says, we're both normal, not thyroid. So the ranges, as society is getting more and more out of balance and sick, the ranges, I don't want to be normal for 70% of the people who went and had this test, which means they're not feeling well. I want to be in the normal range of all the people who don't have a thyroid problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Since we're, yeah. If you get this stuff right, do you see people be able to go off? Yeah, the question was, if you do this right, have I seen people being able to taper down and get off of thyroid hormone? Not without your doctor working with us, but yes. Because what if, we go back to the, um, the mason, what if you don't have enough tyrosine and iodine, and that's why your thyroid is low? We can give you thyroid hormones. But as we saw, depending upon what's going on, your levels should fluctuate throughout the day, depending upon what demand you're putting on your body. When you're taking a, sub, a prescription, you get a steady level for 20 hours and it drops. So what if we start giving you what the body needs and this little guy has the ability to make more when it has the building blocks? Then all of a sudden, you're gonna find your TSH starts going down. Because the body's saying, whoa, we have too much hormone. And then the answer is, let's decrease the drug a little bit. So that's a good thing. You might wind up being up all night because you're a little too wound up. But that's a very good thing. What if your thyroid is just burnt out? It can only make 70% of what your body needs. No matter what you give it, it's not going to make any more. And then you know you won't be able to get off of it. But it's worth, I think, trying. Mm -hmm. Okay, we talked about stress, time management, trying to do things easier instead of making them harder for ourselves. Um, being a guy, it's very easy to bring home stuff and then say, yeah, I'll put this away tomorrow or I'll find a place for this tomorrow. Just like in the office, they say only handle a piece of paper once. Mm -hmm. Have it in your hand, do something with it. So if you have a lot of other people, you give it them. <laughs> but 
how many of us we get this pile of stuff and then finally months later we look at it and say that is so old it all goes in the trash should have gone in the trash three months ago and then you didn't have to dust around it how about if someone aggravates you all the time one of my clients told me she finally was a very old woman who finally got feeling better and she said now that my head's clear i figured out the answer of life oh i figured out here we go and so I said, what is it? She said, you know the 80-20 rule that we use 20% of our dishes 80% of the time and we wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. We have too much stuff and if we got rid of 80% of it, we probably wouldn't even know we missed it. <laughs> she said, think about all the things that really stress you. You can only have a direct effect on 20% of it. And we spend 100% of our time trying to change the 80% that is because of you or you that I have no chance of changing. And so I said, well, that sounds real good. And now we identify the problem, but what do you do about it? She said, spend that 800% of the time figuring out how to make, since you can't help that person, do, do it better or easier. Figure out a way to make the person feel happy that, yep, you're right, we'll do it your way. And I let you think I'm doing it your way. And then we work around you. We get the job done. I don't care that you think, see, he did it my way and it's right. If you and I have been butting heads about that for 10 years, I'm the idiot. Keep butting heads with you. Let you think, yep, we'll do it your way. And get the job done. Say, see, wasn't that easy? And instead of getting aggravated, go, yeah, I wish I listened to you 10 years ago. And that stress is gone. And then the next time we have that issue, we do it the same way. Yep, how do you want me to do it? Great, done. And I do it my way, it gets done. You think you're brilliant, and we're all happy, and I'm not stressed because I'm not thinking about, oh, it's the first of the month, we're gonna go through this again. It's 12 times a year. So, you know, we can do things easy, much easier. Um, we finally, at home, my parents moved, and they almost got divorced over some of the stuff that was in the house that there wasn't room in Florida, and my mother didn't want to get rid of some of it. My father said, we're not moving it down there to throw it out. So I rented a U-Haul, and I said, I'll throw it in my attic, and when you come up, we'll go through it, you know, in six months. And that was 16 and a half years ago. We had water in the attic. So I, well, unfortunately, it didn't get all their stuff wet. That would have been, sorry, I had to dump it. But I kept putting it off. In the summer, it's too hot, and in the winter, it's too cold. And then finally, you know, twice a year, my wife says, we have to do the attic. And I agree with her, and I always find an excuse that we'll do it in the fall, and then we'll do it in the spring. <laughs> so finally, just one day, I'm 61 now, the light bulb went on. This has been 16 years. Why don't we just spend the weekend, haul everything down, decide what we're keeping, call my parents and my sisters. You want it? Let me know. I'll hold it for you for a couple of weeks. But if nobody wants it, we're donating everything. And we did that, and that was like an elephant off my back. And I was like, it was 15 years ago. We built it up in the attic, and you didn't have to worry about it. It took water in the attic. But how about all those other things that we keep putting on? Get that stress off and do it. So think about how to de-stress your life, because it's all about balance. Stress in, stress out. Nutrients in, waste product out toxins in toxins out we can eat some crummy food and we can be exposed to some toxins if we're doing it right most of the time the body is very resilient it's when we do it wrong all the time that eventually something breaks and once it's broken and the tissue is damaged that's as good as it gets but our bodies are so resilient we can beat it up almost for our lifetime it's like they say smokers. If they stop smoking after 30 years, the body will clean out most of the junk. You know, after you've done that. Okay, so you have to do some lifestyle changes. Thyroid, 52 million Americans suffer from thyroid condition and they don't even know it. How sad is that? But that's mainly because your TSH is fine. So it's not thyroid. It could be thyroid. Your cortisol levels fine, so it's not adrenals. Your female female hormones. Estrogen goes up and down and you ovulate. 
And after you ovulate, progesterone goes up. If you don't plant an egg, a fertilized egg, it drops off. You start having hormone issues. They take blood on Thursday afternoon, look and say, yep, for day 14 of your cycle, you're right where you should be, it's not hormones. What happens two weeks later? Or the next day? Or the week before? You need to chat, they're doing this. So just because they're right on this day, doesn't mean at the end of the cycle they're right. So we can't just go by that snapshot. We have to go by, how do you feel? What's going on? What's changed? This young lady on the left, a little kid, she had a thyroid problem. But on the right, three months of just minimal doses of thyroid hormone. Look at the difference in this. But adults, how many adults walk, are walking around looking like that? A whole bunch of people. But they don't have real serious thyroid symptoms, so they're not treated. It's just more sleep with a little dark circles under your eyes. Okay, thyroid affects every part of the body. 60% of the population are fully balanced thyroid-wise. We talked about T4 going into T3. Signs of thyroid glands out of balance. A lot of the same things that we talked about with the adrenals. The same things we talked about female hormones. So it is a symphony and they're all affecting each other. And it's very hard to just use those symptoms and say, oh, that's definitely thyroid, or that's definitely adrenal. You have to look at what's going on in your life. When did it start? What was going on before it started? Gee, life was stressful. We, my husband lost his job. We had two kids in college and my mother, God forbid, got breast cancer. And then I started hot flashing four months later. I think stress had anything to do with that. And it's probably adrenals, not female hormones. What about I had a partial hysterectomy? So that will affect the adrenals, it's stressful, but now it probably is female hormones that's driving it. Or I had some radiation treatment. I had a spot that was near my thyroid. So that was man-induced, but it's probably thyroid drive. Um, toxicity, nutritional deficits, iodine, and tyrosine, we talked about. And if you have an I, a tyrosine deficiency, what's that gonna do to the adrenals? You can't make cortisol. So the thyroid's off, but the adrenal's off. And since the thyroid's off, it's stressing the adrenals more, and your demand for tyrosine for both is even higher, and you have less of it. Symptoms of hypothyroidism, again, and I put all these in just to show, it's almost the same list we talked about for the other two hormonal issues. It just goes around and around. Um, fatigue, irritability, mood swings, weakness, insulin resistance, decreased libido. Is that menopause? Is that adrenal fight or flight or is that thyroid? Yes. Mm -hmm. Probably is a little bit of all of them. And the interesting thing is as you're treating one with the adrenals, Part of the therapy is tyrosine. So the adrenals are stressed and the thyroid is a little low. You give me the tyrosine. Are you treating the adrenals or the thyroid? Yes. Yeah. You're treating the body. And the body's going to use it where it needs it. Can it be harmful if you take it and you don't need it? No. Anything is harmful in way too high a dose. But in a therapeutic dose, no. It's an amino acid that you would get from protein. And so, no. You know, it comes 500 milligrams up to three or four times a day is still at the low end of the doses. So everything we talked about, I'd say the only thing that I would caution, if someone has real high blood pressure, I wouldn't want them taking licorice. Mm -hmm. Now, it can be dealt with, but I don't want people just buying something with licorice in it, because if your pressure's already up to here, it's going to push it higher. What about the DGL? The DGL, deglycerinized licorice, doesn't raise your blood pressure, but that's more for helping with the lining of the um, digestive tract. It doesn't do that much for the adrenal. <coughs> you need the, the true licorice. And if those of us that remember real licorice, not just the black and red looking licorice, a lot of people years ago, there were a lot of good licorice candies. And when you were stressed, 
You went and saw Hershey's chocolate or licorice. You grabbed the licorice. You knew it. You're like a cat or a dog that goes out and doesn't feel well. It goes by all the different plants and all of a sudden it licks or tastes one and it eats it and throws up and feels better if something was in its stomach that shouldn't have been. How do they know that? They didn't go on the internet and look things up. They innately know, just like when we're stressed, we want salt. If we don't think of potato chips, then it's a good thing. And when your adrenals are stressed, licorice, even people who don't like licorice, it tastes good when you're stressed. And so body is a pretty amazing thing. Hypoglycemia, weakness, shaking, irritable headaches, sweats, hunger, often, um, person is big and overweight, but if you look at hypoglycemia, if you have blood sugar issues, similar to hot flashes, and if blood sugar is going up and down, you're definitely not thinking about sex, you're thinking about a donut. <laughs> so is that my hormones are down, that's why my libido is down, your blood sugar is down. If it turns into amino acids, can it be in the protein, like beef? Yes. That you eat. So if you're eating the right kind of protein, can you get it that way instead of Yes, supplement? if everything is working well, but what if you burnt out your tyrosine supply in the body, you're not going to probably be able to eat enough meat to fill the tank up. But nature intended, if we ate right and lived pretty good, that if we eat the foods, even if we go through a stressful month, we'll deplete our stores, but then as we're eating, we'll fill it back up. The problem is most of us aren't eating, we're microwaving a lot of the food, which destroys it, or it's fast food, so you can eat chicken, but it really isn't a roast chicken. I remember growing up, we would come home, my grandmother lived next door, some of my parents were working. Every day, almost every day, you came home from elementary school, so was that 2.30? Because back then, you got out of school, you didn't stay till 7. <laughs> and it would smell delicious, because you had to cook the food. The food cooked for hours and it smelled good. Now, we throw it in the microwave, or we cook it, or we reheating it, or we stop at Whole Foods and buy it and then reheat it, which is better than fast food. But nutritionally, the food isn't what it should be. Farm-raised fish isn't as good as wild fish. Grass-fed beef and chicken. Beef, loaded with bad fats. That's why it's not good for us. Grass-fed beef is loaded with omega-3s. Not harmful, as long as you're not eating it seven nights a week. What are the cows supposed to be eating? Grass, not corn. What are the chickens supposed to be eating? Whatever they can find on the ground, they're supposed to be running around. A lot of people say they don't like wild salmon because it doesn't taste good and it's a little tougher. It's not as soft. That's because it's swimming to survive and hunting food. It's not swimming in a circle waiting to be fed and have red dyes or orange dyes added. At least now they use vegetable dyes to make the farm salmon orange. But it's supposed to be orange because of the nutrients. So if they add color to it, how much nutrients is there? Now it's better than eating a McDonald's burger or Kentucky Fried Chicken farm raised. But if you eat the real stuff, you're much better off. And then you don't need to supplement. But you need to fill the tank up first. Um, insomnia. Trouble getting or staying asleep. Insomnia can be lifestyle, stress, adrenals, thyroid, female hormones, snoring partner, kids. Be a lot of things. You gotta figure out the why. Fix the why. Sometimes take something to get you back on track and then you sail off into the sunset. Nobody should have insomnia for life. Nobody should have hot flashes for seven years. Some women go through menopause 45, 50 to 60, and they hit 70 or 75, and they're flashing for years. What's that all about? It's not female hormones at that point. But Excuse me. something to look forward how, to. How do you know how long to stay on something? Okay. Part of it is, if you've been out of balance for a while, you might, once you get the body somewhat stabilized, you're going to feel much better. But you want to wait till the foundation is really solid. So trial and error and working <coughs> with somebody who will hold your hand and walk through it. So with the adrenals, what we do is if you are exhausted and the adrenals are <coughs> down, 
it's if you've been that way for years, it could be six, eight months. If you've been that way just for a little while, it's less, you, you probably feel better. Feel better so, so what you do is we'll even get you on a good adrenal protocol, and then when you felt good for let's say 60 days, cut the dose down and give it a couple of weeks and see, still having almost all good days, we all have an odd day, then we'll stop. Now, a lot of times people will say, I don't think what we're doing is helping. And sometimes it might not, but a lot of times if you feel really bad and you're making baby steps forward, you don't really see it because you're all living it. It's like with a baby, you see a newborn a week later, you haven't seen them in a week, they're huge. But if you're the mother, you're seeing them 24 hours a day, they haven't changed. So what I do sometimes is tell people, you know, you're right, just take a couple weeks off. And if you were feeling better and you slide backwards a little, you really notice that. So sometimes it, it's hard. We can also tell if your adrenals are off, your hands and feet are probably always freezing. So if all of a sudden, in the middle of the winter, you're not cold or in the summertime it's 85 degrees and you don't have a sweatshirt on, you know, that's good. Let's back down and see if that stays. So it's not carved in stone. A very loose type thing is for every year you've been out of balance, you need at least a month of therapy. But you also have to remember if let's say in 2014, I really had exhausted adrenals. I had an adrenal problem for a while before that. It was 2014 that they just said, the hell with this, I can't deal with it anymore. And I got symptoms. So it's not just that period. You have to think of when it might have started. And it's, you know, when you look back, hindsight's always 2020. You know, you would say, geez, why didn't I see that coming? Because you were living and it gets ahead of you. Can I ask a you mentioned uh, the, the cold hands and feet, but um, I, for example, already have Raynaud's syndrome, so yep. I wouldn't know if that would get better Okay, a and little bit. Like I've said a couple of times, yes and no. A lot of people have Raynaud's syndrome, and they have all the symptoms of Raynaud's, and it's adrenals or thyroid or both, and when that gets balanced, all of a sudden they don't have a problem. Or if you have the tendency, instead of you're out in the middle of the summer at the beach, so you're a little wet, and a cloud comes by, a lot of people, just a cloud going over the sun, so it drops three or four degrees, their fingers turn white. That might stop happening. So it might not be as intense a problem. If you have true rain odds, you have true rain odds. But a lot of times, we label it because you have all the symptoms, but that's not what's causing it. And so it could get better. How many people, when you get real stressed and you get over hungry, your hands get cold? You don't have brain odds. That's the adrenals pulling in, trying to conserve heat. And then if you have very sensitive micropapillaries, that can trigger that white stinging, really painful fingers. So a lot of times it does get better, but not all the time because everyone is totally different. Um, I have more slides you know, about supporting the thyroid. This really, again, thyroid, if you have hyperthyroid, you have panic attacks, trembling, shaking, um, flashing, fear of losing control. Geez, that's menopause when you're flipping out. I say that lovingly. Yeah. Either that or you don't care. Just leave me alone. That could be adrenal exhaustion or thyroid. Yes. Okay. What do what do I recommend for detoxing? Because if you're out of balance, well, I think we can all agree we are a little backed up in toxic. It all depends upon what's going on. Think of a river from the snow cap to the ocean. The cells drain into the lymph, which goes to the liver, which goes to the bowel, which goes to Boston Harbor. <laughs> if you're constipated beginning of your detox is let's get the bowel working better, not with laxatives, but let's get it functioning. Because the last thing you want to do is loosen up a bunch of junk and have it hit that dam and get all backed up. If the liver is backed up, the bowel is working, but it's the liver that's a problem, we want to do liver 
support. And so what's very interesting, a lot of the protocols, like the adrenal protocol or a thyroid or a pituitary protocol, in the products is a, a support for a gentle detox. And then once you get the system working, then you can do a good detox. I don't like the liver flushes. A lot of people do liver flushes, which get the liver, it's like wringing out the liver and the gallbladder. What if you have gallstones? And you cause the gallbladder to spasm, you can loosen up the stone and plug the bile duct and you have the gallbladder removed. And that's not an extra part. Um, you know, it has a purpose. So we want to protect it. So I like doing gentle detox support over a period of time. You go on with your life, you're not staying at home for a week because you're not eating at all, or you're not using so many laxatives that you're married to the bathroom and you can't leave the house. How about we help increase the quality of your life to clean up the body? So there's all different types of detox. There's products that have dandelion, milk, thistle, artichoke, very tonic for the liver. I recommend most people do that twice a year for a month. If you're feeling great, do it twice a year for a month. If you're feeling lousy, do it twice a year for maybe two months. Just help the liver. Don't flush it. Give it what it needs so it can do the detox at the speed the body can deal with. Yeah. But sometimes using a blend, not just milk thistle, but blended with dandelion and artichoke and blue flag, they all work together and they all work on phase one, phase two, different parts of this process to give the body what it needs so your body can detox faster than your body because of where you your adrenal energy. So give it everything it needs and let the body do it. Don't force it. Now, if someone has heavy metals, we have <coughs> detoxes that force the loosening of the metals from the tissue and bind it up so it goes out through the stools. But most people don't need that. So you don't want to do a real strong heavy metal detox without knowing what's going on. And you want to make sure that river is open and there aren't any dams in it. Because the last thing you want to do with the body buried some metabolic waste that's toxic, you don't want to loosen it up from where the body buried it if it can't get out. That's like being exposed again. So you cause the pro you cause damage a second time, which is good. So that's where figuring out what's going on and where your dams are in the river compared to your dam. And if your adrenal energy is very low, last thing you want to do is a detox. That takes a lot of energy. So if you start trying to force the body to detox, you're going to burn the battery out. You're going to tank. How many people have done a detox and felt worse? Headaches and crampy and no energy. That's because you're doing it faster than the body can deal with all the metabolic waste. So in the long run, it took you longer to get to the end point. You're better off going slow and slow and steady. The hair always gets there first over the wrap. It's been a long night. Um, Okay. We talked about stress, the thyroid stress causes mild thyroid dysfunction. You have more stress, major thyroid dysfunction, which creates even more stress. You start pouring gasoline on the fire. So what's the answer as this is going on? Not treat the adrenals or the thyroid or the female hormones. Lifestyle or food. You're not eating well, that could be the stress. You're not giving the body the fuel. So why start trying to play with thyroid hormones? Give your body the fuel in this. Get your lifestyle straightened up. Start relaxing some of the time. And I know that's very easy. This slide is about post-war syndrome, but it's not just the guys and ladies who go over to Iraq or are fighting. It could be you're in the midst of a divorce or a real bad work situation where you're constantly being threatened. You know, even if it's just your job, not physically, you are in fight or flight all the time. That's survival, and that throws everything off. So people 
you know, we think about the toxicity in the environment, or we think about the food supply, or we think about maybe I'm not happy at my job and things like that. But a lot of our problems come from even bad relationships. Or it could be a good relationship and you could be the person who wants somebody to say, I love you, please come by and squeeze your, your arm. Or you could be the person you know, who really needs it. It could be a loving relationship, but you're not getting the love the way you need it. That's very stressful. And then 20, 30 years down the road, you know, when you're 50, 60, and you're saying, is this what it's all about? But do some, say something, do something about it. Hit them over the head. Um, stress management, again, all different ways. Yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, walking. Some people walk themselves in the bathroom. <laughs> that's the only place people will leave you alone. A lousy place to be sitting for a half hour, you know, even if you have a nice bathroom. But figure out what helps you relax. Scrubbing the tiles, watching a stupid sitcom. If you enjoy it, somebody makes fun of you, throw them out of the room. <laughs> that's, that's what you like. You know, some people like to watch sports for hours and hours. And then you ask them, what's the score? I don't know. You know, you just zoned out. But if that's how that person relaxes, more power to them. But I don't have to sit there with them. You know? So figure it out. Um, thyroid imbalance and menopause and perimenopause. If the thyroid's off and you're in menopause, the home, female hormones are really stressing the thyroid and the adrenals. So you're fatigued or exhausted, irritable, too hot or too cold, depressed, anxious, panicky, um, bothered by changes in your skin or hair color if you have hair, um, at the mercy of your moods, weight gain, losing enthusiasm for life. That could be adrenals, could be thyroid, could be female hormones, or it could be the life situation. Depression is causing. So you got to start digging to figure out the why. Um, Thyroid hormones have a direct effect on the appetite centers in the brain. So a lot of times your food cravings, it's your fault, but it isn't your fault. It's hormonally driven. Um, so you're eating more, your blood sugar's going up and down, you're eating more calories, you're eating the wrong foods. That isn't fueling the body, you're making less neurotransmitters. Where do we use more neurotransmitters, in the brain or in the belly? We use about 80% of the neurotransmitters that we worry about. Serotonin, um, dopamine. Dopam thank you, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. We use more of it in the gut than we do in the brain. So if you need to be on an SSRI because it's low here, what's going on here? How are you breaking down the food and making those neurotransmitters? I wonder why they're low. Um, Thyroid problems can cause eye problems. All sorts of things. thyroid eye issues that are directly related to thyroid. Um, thyroid and sex, or lack thereof. Very interesting. <coughs> In thyroid really affects the sex hormones and the brain. In men, you have decreased testosterone if you're hypothyroid. If you have low thyroid, testosterone goes down. If you have high thyroid, you change female hormones, the estrogen gets converted into testosterone, so testosterone goes up. And if testosterone is too high, that makes for a very aggravating or aggravated and sometimes dangerous guy. You know, guys who inject testosterone, they're not too happy, but also lead to infertility. In women, if you have hypothyroidism, you have decreased estrogen and progesterone, and if you have hyperthyroidism, you have too much testosterone, which can screw up libido and fertility. So the thyroid directly affects the female hormones. Female hormones directly affect the thyroid and the adrenals. Then the stress you're under directly affects the whole orchestra. So you can make some pretty lousy music. If, some, if one little area is off, it affects everything. Yes. Is that why there's so many transgender kids now? I don't know. That's a very interesting point. Another, well, let's throw, some, let's throw something else out. In the younger ages going, and this is Thoughts by Gary. 
But when you're getting into preteen and teen, that's a very confusing experimenting time anyway. And it's safer in that area to experiment now because you're more protected. Number two, we have, we talk women out of breastfeeding because it's much better to drink Similac. Give the baby, you know, my generation, I was born in the 50s, and the mothers were told you'll have a healthier baby if you give the formula, because we can make better formula than your breast can. I don't know what, where that came from. But now we have all these digestive problems. A lot of babies are being delivered C-section. They're not getting the good bacteria, so they have digestive problems. So what do we do? Put them on a soy-based formula. So we have all these boys for the first two years of their life are only getting soy and that's estrogenic. I don't know. Does that have anything to do with it? Every single pesticide that we use is estrogenic like. And we're making them so good. I remember when I was younger, we had a few apple trees, we'd spray them. And then of course it rained the next day. So you had to go out and spray them again. Now the pesticides are so good that you can use soap and water and it won't, a lot of them won't wash off. And they're estrogenic like. So you as the mother, the breeder, estrogen levels are much higher. The father has higher amounts of some of these estrogenic products and you make a baby and then you give it estrogenic formula. Does that have anything to do with it? I don't know. The cows, we're giving them all sorts of growth hormones. Does that have anything to do with it? Does giving the antibiotics to the industry, the animal industry, that affects the gut because they're finding now there are therapeutic levels in our blood when we eat that. And that's affecting the gut and the way the bacteria in the gut get disturbed. Is that changing hormones or neurotransmitters? Who knows? But we've changed and screwed up so many things that we don't know what's going on anymore. And now we're genetically engineering food and we feel that if you look at it, it looks like a salmon, it swims like a salmon, so it's identical to the real salmon, so we don't even have to label it that it was genetically engineered because it's this, don't worry, I'm a government. I wouldn't, let it, I wouldn't let it be not labeled if it wasn't identical. I want to make that choice. There's a great movie that's by a 27 year old young man GMO-OMG. Yeah. 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 Yes. Can the thyroid be um, genetic? Yes. Okay, can the thyroid mm -hmm. issue be genetic? Mm -hmm. Yes, it can be inflicted or it can be genetic. And genetics, now that we've mapped out the genome, we have a lot more things we can experiment and look at. So maybe we can design the perfect human, which I hope we never do. Um, different groups have already tried that over the eons. But with, it looks like genetics we all have because of our hereditary. We have, we're genetically predisposed to different things. But what we're finding is there's switches there and we have to flip the switch. So it's either something, toxicity, a lifestyle, or we can do things to make it harder for that gene to be expressed. And so genetics plays a big role. We can have identical twins and one of them gets this problem and the other one doesn't and they grew up together in the same lifestyle. But then when they separated and went their own way, the lifestyle changed. Somebody was doing something that helped not express it and somebody did something to express it. So if cholesterol runs in your family, that's a button I don't like because everyone says, nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, I'll have to go on a stat. There's a whole lot of things you can do about it. And same thing, high blood pressure. Why should I bother behaving? The side of the family, everyone's on blood pressure meds. So I'm gonna get high blood pressure. Not necessarily. And so it's all what you're doing and it might get expressed, but you wanna stack things up, hopefully to make it harder to express that gene than just say, how oh, the hell with it, I'll do whatever I want because it's going to happen anyway. You know, why wear a seatbelt? Uh, you know, a cement truck could hit your car if you're wearing a seatbelt, you're going to die anyway. So why bother wearing a seatbelt for the other 99% of the time? Yes? Is there anything that can be done 
if you're on a hormone blocker, an estrogen blocker? Well, see, there's yes and no. <laughs> is there if your estrogen is low because you're on an estrogen blocker? So you don't want to raise your estrogen, but you can be doing that's very stressful for your adrenals. So you could be doing something to help the adrenals deal with that. So yes, you can. I most of the time everybody can feel better than they do. You may never get back to perfect, but who's perfect? And who wants to be perfect? But almost everyone can feel better. I don't care if you're terminal and you're 95 years old or if you have bad arthritis, if the joints are worn out, you can't fix them yourself. You have to have them replaced at that point. But if they're starting to wear out, you can lessen the progression and make yourself feel better. With the estrogen blocking, you're putting an extra strain on your adrenals. Adrenal support could probably make you feel better. Okay. I hope it was confusing, but did it make sense? Okay, so I guess the bottom line is, there's no easy answer. It's not, oh, that's my problem. I'm going to take this and I'll be all better. Maybe that's for you. And for you, it might be these two things. And for you, it might be everything's fine. Eat a little better and change your lifestyle. And for you, it might be tell your kids, you're living in my house, these are the rules. And there's the it's hard thing to do that. But but there's the door. You know, if you don't go by my rules, you're 27 years old, it's time for you to get out. You can stay here, but it's under my rules. And they should be helping, not stressing. I'm a parent, it's very easy to say, and I know that doesn't always happen. But you have to start taking charge of your life and your health and working at getting the, getting the balance back. I hope this was helpful. Oh, yeah.